Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Grand Rounds. Um, we have a treat today. Our Grand Round speaker, uh, Dr. Pam Douglas, really does not need an introduction, uh, but I will go ahead and do that because she is a, a renowned teacher, renowned investigator, renowned policy uh, maker, if you will, and shaker in the field of cardiovascular imaging, and she's a great friend over the years. Uh, she is the Ursula Geller Professor of uh, Research in Cardiovascular Disease at the uh, DCRI in, in Duke, and she's also the director of the Multimodality Imaging Program at Duke uh, Research Institute. As many of you know, uh, she really has touched the field of imaging in general, although she grew up as, a, as an echocardiographer like myself. Uh, the span of vision, her vision, and her involvement has been really in multimodality imaging and how does imaging cardiovascular disease uh, look forward to uh, management as well as uh, quality in the area of, of medicine nowadays, and that has been really a, a major focus of her work. Um, she was um, chair of cardiology at the University of Wisconsin, also chair of cardiology at Duke, and uh, has been involved nationally in so many ways. She was president of the American Society of Echocardiography, president of the American College of Cardiology, and besides these leadership areas where she has focused on improving cardiovascular imaging, not only quality, but also its position in the management of patients with cardiovascular disease. She has been an amazing, prolific researcher. Many people who uh, step down from their chair positions usually start slowing down and uh, maybe close to retirement. And actually, if you take a look at her, her uh, uh, impact, uh, her impact is even stronger after uh, uh, serving in chair positions because she has led clinical trials, the PROMISE trial. Now she is focused on research at the DCRI and uh, amazingly productive in so many ways. So um, has been a, a really an amazing and renowned researcher in, in many areas of cardiovascular medicine from women and heart disease, to imaging, to sports medicine, uh, you name it, uh, so many areas of medicine. And she's also on the advisory council of the NHLBI currently that uh, she serves there. It really is a pleasure to welcome uh, Pam among us today. And I know she'll be talking about a, an area that is of interest to all of us, which is chest pain. And I think I'm pretty sure she'll touch upon many of the trials, clinical trials that have clarified where imaging stands in the evaluation of patients with chest pain. Pam? Thank you. It is really, truly my deep pleasure to be here today to uh, be hosted by such a, a wonderful long-term friend, Bill, uh, and to meet so many other friends and people that I've known for a long time. And, and get a chance to talk to you today. Um, so my pleasure being here and I hope you enjoy the next hour. I have been specifically instructed that I can't say anything to the fellowship candidates about Duke. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't, <laughs> except go Duke. <laughs> These are my relationships. The ones that are relevant are uh, GE Healthcare and HeartFlow, which are both uh, research funding, uh, not consultantships or speaker bureaus or anything. I'm going to start with a case. This is not me. This is a composite of the average patient in the PROMISE trial, which uh, I will talk about in a little bit, uh, but was a pragmatic trial of 10,000 patients with suspected coronary artery disease who underwent testing. And this is the average patient in the trial. So when we, when we say, who are we focusing on? What's our population? What do they look like? What's their risk factor burden? This is an average patient, 61 years old, female. As a matter of fact, we have 52% female. Multiple risk factors, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, past smoker, sedentary lifestyle. Symptoms are atypical. <coughs> 
uh, often occurred at risk and with exercise. If we use a Diamond and Forrester uh, uh, risk prediction for likelihood of obstructive coronary disease, it's over 50%. Right? It's a symptomatic, middle-aged, multiple risk factors. That's even the atypical chest pain. And a Framingham risk score, which is meant to be in, used in asymptomatic people, but is still a yardstick for us, was a 17% risk of a cardiac event in the next 10 years. So what would you like to know? This is the patient. What would you like to know? Do you want to reassure them and send them home? Do you want to send them to the cath lab? Do you want to send them to a non-invasive test? If you do send them to a non-invasive test, which test? I think most everybody in this room would want to test this person, would be very uncomfortable saying there's nothing here with, a, you know, by our standard risk score, greater than 50% likelihood of disease. So the question is, which? And we had a hypothesis uh, that was, came out of, and um, so right now, let, let me just frame, frame where the U.S. guidelines sit. So the U.S. Stable Ischemic Heart Disease Guidelines were published in 2012. There is one uh, level one, class one, um, uh, recommendation for a patient like this, and that's uh, treadmill exercise testing. 2A, which is, could do, but not as good as a, as a 1, is stress echo, stress nuclear, and stress MR. And 2B is a CT. So that's where the U, and 2B is kind of don't do it, you know, may not hurt you, but don't really do it. Stay away from it. So that's where we stand in the United States today. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with how many people would do stress ECG as a first, as a treadmill ECG as a first test? Yeah. So the guidelines, you're not following the guidelines. <laughs> One person, raise a hand, you're not following the guidelines, just so you know. Plus the guidelines don't tell us, so you know, 2A, two, two, two I think most of us would do a stress imaging of some sort or another. Um, they don't tell us which one. So do we do it based on reimbursement to us? Do we do it based on convenience to the patient? You know, how, how do we do radiation, um, cost? You know, how do we pick? We really don't know. Um, and then into this confusion, if you will, or certainly lack of clarity, comes a brand new test, CT angiography, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, started to be 16 slice and higher where we could start to see things. And the question is, is this any better? You know, we are gold standard for obstructive coronary disease is angiography, is a cath lab angiography. So now we can do angiography non-invasive. Why is that, should that be the gold standard as opposed to uh, stress-induced ischemia? And so NIH convened a workshop to say, you know, can we look at imaging outcomes? Does the test matter? Which test we choose, does it matter for patient outcomes? Convened a workshop in 2008, and the single highest recommendation out of that trial was we need to compare anatomic versus functional imaging head-to-head -head in a randomized controlled trial. And the hypothesis was that you could substitute CT for stress testing and potentially do better. And so that was the hypothesis. Uh, we were funded to do the PROMISE trial. There was a very parallel trial that I'll also talk about in Scotland called Scott Hart. Uh, that was uh, published at the exact same time as promised, actually 24 hours later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, JCC. <laughs> um, but uh, at the same time, um, and I'll show you those data. And then I'll talk about, and that's 2015, and uh, just to, to, you know, not hold suspense, n neither uh, uh, promise showed no difference in events. Scott Hart showed improved diagnostic thinking but at the time it was sort of called a wash. Um, and so basically we did a lot of trials and tested a lot of patients and kind of ended up with a wash. As we have been continuing to drill down on this topic as we get more trials, as we get more data, as we look at groups, we find that it's actually not so simple. You can't do this simple substitution and cookbook. The different tests provide different information. They have different test performance and their sensitivities and specificities vary by patient risk. No surprise there, that's Bayesian principles. 
their demographics and, and comorbid subgroups actually matter in terms of how useful the tests are. And the goals of testing also matter. Do you really want to know if this patient has obstructive disease or not, or do you want to know what their long-term risk is? And the answer is we do want to do both, but you kind of want to know some different things in different people. And so what I'm going to uh, try to support, a hypothesis I'm going to support during this hour, is one that, that what we need to do now is something I call precision testing, and this is stealing from the personalized medicine, precision medicine, where you don't, we evaluate risk on a population, but we risk modify in an individual. And so we evaluate test performance across a population, but we select a test and interpret those results for an individual patient, and I call that precision testing. And that is selective use of different test modalities as determined by individual patient risk, clinical goals, and the information that that test provides. So that's my hypothesis, and we'll see if we reach them. So Scott Hart is one of the trials uh, that was presented. This was just over 4,000 patients who had stable chest pain, who were randomized after their initial evaluation that the uh, British system has rapid access chest pain centers um, that do a full initial evaluation, including an exercise ECG. And to that, they either uh, did nothing different, that's their usual care, or they added CT to a Bruce Protocol treadmill test. Um, so it's in addition. Their population, a quarter of them had obstructive coronary disease amongst the ones that had CT, and PROMISE was a lower risk population. Their primary endpoint was an intermediate endpoint. It was uh, diagnostic thinking. So if you think of all the evidence that we get from tests, the first thing we need to know is test performance, sensitivity, and specificity. Then we need to know if it changes how we think about a patient. If we change how we think about a patient, do we change their treatment? And does changing that treatment change outcomes? And so it's upstream from outcomes, but obviously is in the chain by which you could plausibly affect outcomes. If you don't change your diagnosis, clearly you're not gonna change your treatment, you're not gonna affect outcomes. So you have to do that first. And they, they did uh, a physician assessment um, was for the presence of angina and the presence of coronary heart disease. So, and they tested certainty, which was whether you went into a yes or no versus a probable, possible, unlikely gray zone in the middle, that's certainty. And then they tested frequency, which was yes, probable, so on the side of likely versus on the side of unlikely or no. And what you see is the primary diagnosis of angina due to coronary heart disease, the certainty was increased by 80% with CT, but the frequency didn't change, which, which meant some people came in and some people came out. Um, similarly, the diagnosis of coronary heart disease alone, the certainty was, again, uh, more than twofold more certain of the diagnosis, um, but the, again, the frequency did not change too much. And this is makes sense if you actually see plaque or see obstructive plaque, you're gonna be more certain about what those symptoms come from than, than if you, um, than you are prior uh, beforehand. So as a result, uh, they said, this is papers uh, published subsequently by them, um, there was a substantial change in treatment in the patients undergoing CT and what we see, uh, that is not attached to me, that mouse keep me from using it. I keep using the mouse for the pointer. <laughs> I've got my own computer here. Um, what we see here is the antiplatelet therapy in the CT group versus the usual care group and statin treatment CT and usual care group. And you can see that it, it depends on the CT result with very little change in those uh, with no coronary disease, which is those little, little teeny little green things here, but a substantial increase in aspirin and statins in the non-obstructive disease group as well as the obstructive group. And don't forget the non-obstructive group is likely to be absolutely silent by treadmill testing. So a significant change in treatment in a population uh, which would not be detected by usual care. In addition to medical testing, uh, they tracked uh, use of the cath lab and triage to the cath lab. And as you can see here, they had um, no difference in the frequency of invasive catheterization, about 20% in their population, but a substantial difference in the findings at catheterization. 
So using a CT guided model, only 20% of the people went to the cath lab who did not have actionable disease. In other words, who did not have obstructive disease. 80% of the people that ended up in the cath lab had lesions over 70% or 50% left main. In contrast, more than 50% in the usual care group did not have actionable CAD. Now, I don't know if those caths were indicated or not. There's certainly a, a reason to cath people when you don't expect disease for reassurance and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not saying indicated or not indicated, just not actionable. And revascularization, not surprisingly, was uh, slightly higher in the CT group. There was more disease in the group, right? And overall, if we look at the rate of invasive catheterization without actionable disease or without obstructive disease, it is more than twice as high in the usual care group. So CT really helped with triage to the cath lab or the use of invasive testing. How about outcomes? This is uh, the, the uh, survival curve uh, for uh, coronary cardiac death uh, and non-fatal MI. And uh, CT is the lower line here with, with uh, a 40% uh, reduction in uh, death and MI. This missed by a hair, this was a secondary endpoint, pre-specified by secondary endpoint, missed significance by a hair, which was heartbreaking for them in the trial. And they subsequently did, and uh, they then did notice this early phase where the curves didn't um, diverge and, and did a landscape analysis where they separated out the first few weeks here, the first um, uh, six or eight weeks and then did a landscape, a land, landmark analysis, sorry, here starting at that time point at seven weeks and found a 50% uh, reduction that was highly significant. And when they went back to, to look at what happened in those first seven weeks, the answer was nothing because they were waiting for their tests in the British system. So people actually didn't receive the intervention, if you will, the additional CT test, until seven weeks after randomization. So the, this um, landmark analysis is basically at the time of receipt of the intervention. There is an immediate change in, in delay, uh, immediate change uh, divergence in outcomes here that is significant. Uh, not surprisingly, the CT was an additional, to addition to usual care and uh, resulted in more interventions and so was more expensive uh, than usual care but with a, a substantial outcome advantage. So the Scott Hart investigators, Dave Newby and that group, um, uh, concluded that in patients presenting with suspected angina due to coronary disease, the addition of CT to exercise testing and usual care increases the diagnosis of coronary heart disease, improves preventive treatment, does not change the cath rate, but increases cath yield, tends to increase revascularizations that you could argue might be a good thing, obviously outcomes are better, um, and increases costs by 32% over usual care. But most importantly, I think we focus on outcomes first, hard outcomes first, and card uh, uh, cardiac death and MI reduced by 50% after the implementation delay. And, and this is biologically plausible for all the reasons that I've talked about. They, they uh, receive more revascularizations, um, obstructive disease is, is addressed in the cath lab more frequently because it's seen more frequently, and they receive better um, secondary prevention uh, with medications. So the PROMISE trial is a trial that I had the honor of running, NHLBI-funded trial, um, with Udo Hoffman at MGH as uh, running our testing uh, group, Manesh Patel, Danmark, um, and Carrie Lee at, at Duke, Lawton Coopers at NIH, um, really a fabulous team effort. And we designed this trial um, back in 2008 for 10,000 subjects. They were patients just like, as it turned out, the one I presented at the beginning, um, with symptoms suspicious for significant coronary disease, who had not, no previous history of heart disease, and who required non-emergent, non-invasive testing. So this is different from the ED usual care versus CT, for which there have been several randomized trials, the Romacat trial, the Akron trial, and so on, which were basically efficiency trials that said you get out of the ER faster, or out of the chest pain evaluation unit faster um, with CT with no um, decrease in, uh, no decrement, non-inferiority on outcomes, but more efficient uh, care. 
we actually were looking at outcomes, but these are the people that you see in the office, um, not the people that you see in the emergency room. We randomized these patients to either an anatomic strategy of a 64 slice or better CT or a functional strategy of the investigator's choice. Whatever was good at the institution, whatever was convenient at that, uh, for that patient, um, whatever worked at the site, very pragmatic trial, uh, could be exercise or pharmacologic stress, uh, echo or nuclear imaging, um, uh, NIH declined to use PET or MR um, for this. And uh, the test results were read at the site, so again, very pragmatic. We didn't want to have a core lab read intervening with usual care. We wanted to know how patients were treated. And we also wanted the results to be immediately available for these patients who were having a chest pain evaluation. You can't take a week to send it to the core lab and have it interpreted. And we had management uh, arranged by the site team, and in this way we were able to see what the impact of the test results were on changes in care. We had a minimum follow-up of at least a year. Um, mean, uh, median was um, 25 months and maximum was 52 months, um, so out past four years. And our primary endpoint was all-cause death, uh, MI, uh, periprocedural complications like a stroke in the, in the cath lab, and unstable angina hospitalizations. And our secondary endpoints were components of the primary, or MACE. Uh, cath without coronary disease, as you've seen it, and, you know, non-actionable cath, costs and quality of life. And here's our primary endpoint curve uh, over the years of follow-up. As you can see, CT and functional testing are right on top of each other. Um, with, and even if we explode the first 12 months, uh, it looks like CT may have a little advantage, but not much. Um, stunningly, nothing. And uh, what we, uh, people said to us, well, you, gosh, you, you spent you 10,000 patients and you've got nothing. And I said, actually, we have something. Because until this point, you know, CT is a 2B, right? And now we're saying at least it should be a 2A with stress echo and stress nuclear and stress MR. Uh, we also looked at death or non-fatal MI, got rid of the unstable angina, which was a little bit funky. And in fact, there was a, a benefit, a slight benefit at 12 months uh, that was significant. And there you see the 0.049 with a 34% a 34, um, reduction in death or MI at one year. So we did see some benefit in some of the secondary out outcomes. What about treatment? Well, like Scott Hart, we found an increase in use of preventive treatment. Aspirin, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors were all increased in the CT group. Um, new, more new prescriptions for these medications in the CT group than in the functional group. Interestingly enough, none of the lifestyle changes were, were different between the two groups. So increased medication use, um, but, but no difference in quitting smoking or exercising or losing weight. What about the cath lab triage and actionable disease? Well, in our case, uh, there was a 50% increase in use in the cath lab. Our rate was lower um, at an average of about 10%. Remember, Scott Hart was about 20%, but they had twice as much disease in their population. Um, we had a similar uh, mark, remarkable reduction in uh, non-actionable disease in the cath lab. So just 28% were non-actionable in the CT group as opposed to over half in the functional testing group. And not surprisingly, there were twice as many revascularizations in the CT group, again, because there's more disease in the cath lab um, to intervene on. We asked ourselves, you know, is this an oculostenotic reflex? Do those people really need these revascularizations? And so we said, well, if people have a cabbage, they probably needed the revascularization. It's pretty hard to get to the OR for nothing. <laughs> and uh, there were twice as many cabbages in the CT group as in the functional group. And uh, I don't, I have not drilled down on those other 30, 35 patients who uh, had triple vessel disease in the functional group and didn't go to the cath lab, whether that was missed, they were false positive, false negative exercise tests or what. I don't know that because I don't know their anatomy if their test was negative. So it's hard to tell. But overall, if we look at in a population basis, which is what you need for the strategy selection, you were less likely to go to the cath lab uh, for no uh, actionable disease for non-obstructive disease uh, in the CT group than in the functional testing group. And that was another one of our secondary endpoints. So again, CT improves cath lab triage. Uh, what about cost? Um, this is Dan's mark, Dan Mark's data 
um, which were also presented at the same time as the primary paper. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference between CT and uh, stress uh, imaging or uh, uh, the whole functional strategy, including about 10% stress ECG. So our breakdown was 10% treadmill, uh, about 20% stress echo, and 70% uh, stress nuclear. So even, which is pretty well represents the countries, you know, in terms of what's being done. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the error bars cross zero um, way out through the trial. In spite of increased costs here in early on in CT with the additional casts and revascularizations. So what are our conclusions out of the PROMISE trial? At least in the U.S., in the real world out there, stable, non-acute chest pain currently being evaluated using non-invasive imaging have a very low event rate, and we'll talk more about that, but on the order of one to one and a half percent per year. And that is about the background rate of death and other serious events in the U.S. population at that age. Not all that different. This low event rate was not affected by test choice. However, the CT was associated with improved preventive care, more invasive testing but a higher cath yield, more revascularization, and similar cost. And so our conclusion at the time from this top line data was that given the similar clinical outcomes, CT is a reasonable alternative strategy as a frontline test. It doesn't replace, but alternative should take its place in the choices to stress testing as a first-line investigation in stable chest pain. So this is where we were left in 2015. Probably CT should be considered a little bit more strongly. So what has, how have these data affected what other countries are doing? Absolutely nothing in the United States. There have been no guideline updates in spite of all these trials. Um, in fact, uh, just uh, earlier this week, uh, JAMA Internal Medicine published a meta-analysis of stable angina, um, and I think there's 10 or 12 trials at this point found a definite reduction in MI across that meta-analysis. And uh, the editorial was written by Rita Bradberg, who has been a staunch opponent of CT, and she said, well, you know what, the outcomes are better. And so the evidence are mounting. The United States has done nothing. Britain, the UK system, re-looked at their stable heart disease guidelines last year and they came out with a new set of guidelines in November at, that said CT was more cost effective than SPECT in diagnosing coronary disease over the range of pre -test, intermediate pretest probabilities. And their recommendation for initial testing in patients like the PROMISE patients or the Scott Heart patients where you don't have known coronary disease be only first test they recommend is CT angiography. They do not recommend stress testing any longer in this population. So this is a complete 180 from what our guidelines are. So when you think about imaging as being a relatively boring part of cardiology, we now have uh, the Brits saying CT only, the United States saying stress treadmill testing in our guidelines, we really, there's, there's a bit of a controversy here. So their recommendation for um, patients with a prior history of coronary disease is stress imaging. Uh, so you can locate the, the uh, disease and make, uh, understand uh, whether there's ischemia or not because you know there's going to be lesions. And they do also recommend for people with a very high pretest probability of disease to go direct to cath. So these are the British guidelines. In addition, I'll talk a little bit about um, FFRCT uh, later as an adjunctive way to improve uh, uh, revascularization and cath lab triage even further. So I'll skip that part of this slide. So here we are now. What do we learn from these trials and from other trials like this? Our population being tested has a high risk factor burden. So these, you know, people say we do too many non-invasive tests. We do people that don't have much likelihood of disease. You're testing 20-year-old women with palpitations. That's actually not true. We're testing middle-aged people with a high risk factor burden. These are people we have a right to be concerned about. At the same time, there is a very low event rate, less than 1% per year for cardiovascular death and MI. 
So in individuals, there's a low likelihood of disease and a low likelihood of events, but in our population mix, there's a higher one. The people getting cath in the current era have a low rate of, uh, it, the people uh, being evaluated have a low rate of obstructive disease, only 10 to 20%. And when you go to the cath lab, it's less than 50%. And I'll show you some data on that. And we and very rarely, relatively rarely require revascularization, five to 10%. And what we come out of that is there's no single obvious best testing. We do have the a group that's saying, well, that event rate is so low, you should just treat these people, reassure them, and send them home and not incur any additional costs. The likelihood of a false positive test is gonna trigger, trigger a lot of downstream stuff like all those cats without obstructive disease. No testing is an option, I'll talk about that. We need a more precise cath lab referral for sure. That's expensive, it's invasive, and carries a very low risk, but some risk, it's not, not, uh, not zero risk. And what's obvious is that one size does not fit all. Somehow, we need more information on why we're testing these people and what we hope to get out of this testing. So let's look at that. So can we improve preventive care? Here's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the hour. Which patients are at lowest and highest risk? Can we tell that differently from our current risk scores? Which might benefit from deferred testing or not testing right away? Can we reduce the unnecessary cast or the unneeded cast and improve the cath yield? Can we improve selection for revascularization? In short, can we practice precision tests, testing? I've talked about tailoring our diagnostic strategies and test selection to individual patient risk, testing goals, test performance, in, uh, either by relevant subgroups or at least uh, by individual performance. So preventive care, here's the promise intake population. You saw an increase in medication use after CT, but uh, not as much after stress testing. Here's the gaps, and this just came out a, a month or two ago in BMJ. 14% of those who with a history of hypertension were not treated. 36% of those with a history of dyslipidemia had, were on no medication. 32% of diabetics uh, with normal renal function were not on ASARB. 49% of the population was sedentary. 18% were smoking and almost half of them were obese. So the first thing you can say when this population walks into your office, there's a lot of gaps here. There's a lot that I can do to make this person healthier that has nothing to do with the non-invasive test automatically. We also see that this underuse varied by demographic groups. Women were less likely to use statins and more likely to be sedentary. Elderly people, uh, were uh, also less likely to use sedentary, but also less likely to be obese or smoking. Um, and those with low socioeconomic status um, were more likely to be sedentary and more likely to smoke. So there's some variation by, by demographic groups, none of it terribly surprising given what we know about healthcare disparities uh, in this country. So what about deferred testing, can we find the lowest risk people? And this is a patient paper published in JAMA Cardiology uh, at the beginning of the year in which we sought to create, we called it a no risk tool, but Bob Bono said you gotta say minimum risk, you can't ever say no. And we, all of our modeling, or virtually all of our modeling in cardiology is about predicting events. You know, Framingham risk scores for events, Diamond and Forrester is for coronary disease. All of our Timmy Grace scores after MI are predicting high risk. So we said, turn that around, turn that on its head, and let's look at low risk, right? Because those are the people that we could potentially not test in. That's the group. And so we took the 4,600 patients who had CT and had absolutely no plaque or calcium, no stenosis, obviously, and no events. And that was 27% of our population. So actually we had some low risk people in there. And we ran all of the clinical variables that we could and uh, matched to 10 clinical variables to create a minimal risk score with a, a, a modestly good, a moderate C statistic of 0.725. So not bad, as good as, as men. It's as good as many. In fact, improved over Framingham risk score and Diamond and Forster, you can see there, their C statistics were in the 0.6 range, uh, so we were modestly better. And in fact, the Scott Hart group 
took this algorithm and ran it in Scott Hart as a validation, and they got a, a over 0.8, just over 0.8 in the Scott Hart population, which made us feel great that, that we had actually hit on something. And so in the bottom right, you see the uh, um, uh, AUC curves, and, and our risk tool here is the one to the left, uh, Framingham here and Diamond and Forrester here. Uh, these are the event rates by decile, and uh, the highest decile is the lowest risk. So this is the rate of normal testing, this is the rate of abnormal testing, and the events are these lower bars, which decline to nothing by the time you get out here. And if you want to put yourself into this risk tool, right, you have to be symptomatic, but you can do it. It's at promiseforschools.com if you want to go look at it. So now that we can identify a low-risk subgroup, can we say, should we recommend not testing in these people, deferred testing? In support of that are obviously our low event rates, um, the low likelihood of obstructive coronary disease, uh, other data that show it really doesn't matter whether you revascularize or not, like the COURAGE trial, um, that it provided you provide good medical care, um, and that we have excellent and underused preventive and antianginal therapeutics that are available. Against that is our guidelines all recommend testing in an intermediate risk group. So there's no guideline recommendation to do this, and there's absolutely no prospective data supporting this. In fact, I've looked and tried to find observational data to say how often does a patient with chest pain, or what happens when a patient with chest pain goes to a physician office and has an intermediate likelihood of disease and gets sent home. Because don't forget, both arms in the PROMISE trial underwent testing, both arms in the Scott Hart trial underwent testing, so maybe this low event rate is because people are taken care of. And if you say you're not going to take care of them, we don't know what's going to happen. So there's actually not even observational data from administrative databases. You can't find it. It's very hard. Um, not testing may miss uh, those few people with really uh, significant left main triple vessel disease, high risk disease, uh, for whom uh, revascularization is life saving. And it may require multiple visits and medication adjustments. Uh, there's some liability involved. People, you know, they know their neighbor had a test and got a stent, and so they want their tests and got a stent, just like what happened to Joe or Mary down the block, who did great. So I'm not sure we're ready to do that yet. On the flip side, can we identify some high-risk groups? And we wanted to look at left main um, triple vessel disease or two vessel disease with a proximal LAD lesion. And we did the exact same thing. We identified who these people were on CT with either a 50% stenosis as a cut point, and there were 7% in our population, or 70%, and there was just 2% in the population. And those clinical variables that predicted high risk were Framingham, Diamond and Forster, family history, older age, and lower GFR within the range of normal. We had to have relatively normal to do the CT because we're giving dye. So we didn't have, you know, uh, GFRs in the 10, 20, 30 range. So both in our, in this case, again, both our 50 and 70 percent models were superior to Framingham and Diamond and Forster in predicting high risk disease. And um, this is about ready to head to a journal. So next, can we improve the use of invasive testing and part of what started all this um, was a paper that we published um, back um, in 2009 in the New England Journal showing that the majority of patients who went to diagnostic cath did not have obstructive disease, and at the time this was extraordinarily controversial, and everybody said, that doesn't happen in my lab. And then they went back and looked at it, and it does. It happens in everybody's lab because it's very difficult to tell. And if you look at every single study that's been published since, we repeated it uh, in NCDR later. Uh, the VA looked at it, Scott Hart, the functional testing or the usual care arm and the promise arm, almost all under 50% prevalence of obstructive disease in an elective diagnostic cath. This is not STEMI, this is not NSTEMI, ACS, urgent. This is elective diagnostic cath. And when you look at the CT arms in, in Scott Hart and Promise, it's substantially better. So if you're looking at, at use of the cath lab, it's going to be much better with a CT guided strategy than with a functional strategy. On the other hand, what we worry about is that coronary anatomy is not equal to coronary physiology, and these are uh, graphs from the FAME trial, 
which show that there's a very, very wide variation in fractional flow reserve or hemodynamic significance with every level of stenosis. St startlingly wide, actually. There's really spray of dots. And that you do better, patients do better, if their interventions are guided by hemodynamic significance than by anatomic significance. So we don't want to be acting only on the basis of stenosis. So what, what can we do to combine? Well, of course, you can do the CT and go to the cath lab, do an invasive flow wire measurement, and then send the patients home, which is what they did in the FAME and DEFER and the other trials. Or else you can use a new technology called, uh, which is fractional flow reserve by CT. Do you guys use that at all? No? Not, you know what I'm talking about? So that, that is a, uh, it's currently provided by HeartFlow, a uh, company that, that I received funding to do the platform trial, which is the primary data that I'm showing here. And uh, we looked at patients who went to, who were on their way to the cath lab and had them go have a CT instead. And then what we found out was amongst patients who uh, had usual care, obviously all of them went to the cath lab, just like we've seen, the vast majority in, in red here had no obstructive disease, 73%, not out of the ordinary for what you've seen in the other studies, and about 30% had obstructive disease. Not too terribly different from what you've seen in other studies. Instead, in the FFR group, 60% of them had their caths canceled. So, so just 40% went to the cath lab, the same 30% of obstructive disease was present, the same rate of revascularizations, same outcomes, and just a few people, only 12%, had no obstructive disease. So the use of CT as an adjunct, of FFR CT as an adjunct to CT, gives you hemodynamic information, which allows you to avoid 60% of catheterizations. So this is uh, being considered now, as you saw earlier slide, by the British healthcare system it is a mandate for all patients before they go to catheterization that they uh, anticipate that they will save about $10 million a year in canceled catheterizations over and above the expense of the cath. So as we get more and more into accountable care organizations and being responsible for our costs, we may get more and more like the Brits in doing this. But the FFR information is absolutely helpful in guiding the use of cath lab. So we took that FFR and retrospectively applied it in PROMISE and took 180 patients who had cath and CT and we were able to do the FFR calculation, which is a, a post hoc uh, signal processing um, big data application um, using supercomputers uh, using clinical images. So it's not something you need to do at the time of the CT. You can do it anytime afterwards on CTs that are old, years old. And what we found was that that was much better, FFRCT was much better at predicting events um, and revascularizations than CT, so 4.3% versus 2.9%. And you can see that in the KM curves, Kappenmeier curves out to the right. And then we modeled, well, what if we had added FFR within the PROMISE trial at the time of decision making? Well, of course, we don't know if this is what would happen, but we created an algorithm and applied it. If we canceled the catheterization in all those patients who had uh, no stenosis greater than um, 70% and had a, a normal FFR greater than 0.8, we would avoid the catheterization in uh, over a third of the patients who did have a cath in promise. And in fact, that would drop the cath rate with CT from 12% to 8%, which is exactly what it was in the functional testing group. So it would actually eliminate the over catheterization problem that we had in PROMISE and um, would increase the percent of revascularizations in, in the cath lab um, from 50% to about 60%, so, so more, more actionable stuff in the cath lab. So the addition of that post-processing analysis of FFR onto the CT could actually reduce a limitation of a CT first approach which is excess revascularizations by providing both the functional and anatomic data before you go to the cath lab. What other information about functional significance can we get from, from a um, CT angiography? 
detailed reading of CT, and I'm sure you guys are really good here, I'm sure you guys look at low attenuation plaque, napkin ring signs, body calcification, um, positive remodeling. These are all high risk plaque as opposed to a highly calcified um, concentric plaque. And these findings predict uh, acute coronary syndromes even after controlling for uh, coronary artery disease with a hazard ratio of nine. That's after you control for significant stenosis. So, so these are hot plaques, right? The vulnerable plaque idea that comes from IVIS and OCT is, is measurable by CT non-invasively. And actually the more of these you have, the more it correlates with FFR. So um, the risk prediction um, uh, is incremental to stenosis um, in, in a, acute patients. And what we found in the PROMISE data, and uh, this is in press at JAMA Cardiology, not quite as predictive as it is in the ACS population. Not, not surprisingly, if you will, because these patients are not, not quite as hot as the chest pain population, uh, as the ACS population. We found high-risk plaque in 15% of our patients, uh, most commonly positive remodeling, and followed by that by low CT attenuation. And while our overall event rate was 3% for death MI and unstable angina, in those with high-risk plaque, it was 6.4%, and those without high-risk plaque was 2.4%. So it really helps to segregate people. And you see the, the display of the curves out here uh, for events with an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.7 for presence or absence of high-risk plaque. What we did find, though, when we split it out by those with significant stenosis, positive or negative, and high-risk plaque, positive or negative, you see that there was no plaque at all. That's our base case. If they had plaque but um, no significant stenosis and no high-risk plaque, they had a 2.6-fold event rate increase because they do have something. If they have high-risk plaque and no stenosis, 4.3%, uh, so does provide a significant increment here. If they have stenosis, it's 9.3%. So that really takes a jump. And if they have stenosis and high-risk plaque, it stays at about the same. These are not different, 8.6%. And so these are the steno two stenosis curves um, uh, with and without high-risk plaque, and these are the not significant stenosis with and without high-risk plaque. So it is additive, but not as much as it is in the ACS population. And in fact, it's most additive in the lowest risk groups, women, younger individuals, those um, uh, skinnier individuals, those without diabetes. Um, and in fact, if you take women who are less than our medium age or under 60, the hazard ratio of presence of high-risk plaque was six, so, so quite a bit higher. So maybe very helpful in specific populations to analyze this, but once you have um, significant stenosis, may not be so terribly helpful, at least in the stable population. Next, calcium score. How does this compare? You know, people, it's a very established predictor of future events in asymptomatic individuals based on oodles of observational trials like MESA and so on. It has been recommended as an initial test, but uh, diagnostic test in chest pain, but there's not a lot of data. It does provide surrogate information on plaque presence and severity, um, and it's easier to do the whole angiogram. It's less radiation, it doesn't require beta blockers or nitroglycerin, it's less expensive. So, and that, that's one question. The second question is how does it compare prognostically uh, to functional testing? Because those are our two questions. Do they have coronary disease? And how, what's their, their prognosis? Um, and uh, Matt Budoff presented this as a late-breaking trial at ESC uh, last month and uh, published in CERC simultaneously. And what we found was that this calcium score was exquisitely sensitive to presence of disease. So um, very few patients with a normal calcium score of zero had events versus a lot of patients with a normal stress test. On the other hand, functional testing was very specific for future events. And as you can see the way this breaks out, functional testing here in the severe abnormality, multiple territories versus single territory versus minimally abnormal normal, is very good at identifying severe disease. CT, our calcium score, is very good at identifying this mildly abnormal group and differentiating them from normal. So what this means is that overall discriminatory ability is almost exactly the same, but on opposite sides of the spectrum. 
So if you want to be cleared from having disease, you want a normal calcium score. If you want to know whether you're going to have an event, you want a normal functional test. So they're just really different tests. So any calcium score was more sensitive than an abnormal functional test by a lot, 84% versus 43%. But an abnormal functional test was more specific, 79% versus 35% in predicting events. If we change the cut point for a positive uh, calcium score, right, we're using cut point of zero to get those numbers. We actually have to go to a positive calcium score of 400 as the threshold to get the same performance characteristics as the stress test. So what that really tells you is what's below the tip of the iceberg of a positive of a negative functional test. It's a lot of disease below that iceberg. So let's look more now at, by CT at this, this uh, um, non-obstructive group. And we had a similar test positivity rate. We had a similar event rate for versus a positive and negative test in these. But on the other hand, two thirds of events in both tests were in the not significant stenosis category or the negative ischemia category meaning two-thirds of the events in this population are going to be in people that don't have a significant stenosis by CT or inducible ischemia by a stress test. So we tend to think of the people that are going to have the events are the ones that have tight lesions and the ones that have positive stress tests. In fact, the other group, because it is so much larger, the rate is much lower. That's, that's this. There's, the positive test certainly differentiates. But the negative test group or the lack of stenosis group is so large in this population that most of the events occur there. So we're not doing a good job detecting that. In fact, though, if we look um, by stress and CT, we see that CT is uh, both uh, better able here, uh, even at every level, to be able to detect events than stress, and in particular to be able to exclude events in the normal population. And this is even more enhanced in the um, CV death MI group. So very similar, actually, to the calcium score group. And if we look at functional testing here, you see that the functional testing can't differentiate between the mild abnormalities and the normal patients, the people that can't exercise well, that maybe have positive ECG but negative images. Those people don't differentiate in events in our, in our hands terribly well, but a positive test does. But what you get in this group, which is a large group here, over half the patients with that non-obstructive disease group, and this is critical to treat these patients uh, effectively, to treat them as secondary prevention. So what about some subgroups? Our initial analysis so no change in any of the subgroups. You can just look down that forest plot line and everything crosses. But when we drilled down on that in other subgroups, we found some interesting things. In particular, in women, uh, when we looked at uh, for CT, the rate of events in those with a positive CT versus a negative CT compared to a positive stress versus a negative stress, and what we see was a substantially better ability to, to predictive ability of a positive CT than a positive functional test. Now, we didn't see that difference in men. You see that there, the p-value was 0.3 in men. But in women, we we're much better able to predict a positive test with CT. And I think the reason for this is that women have a lot of false positive stress tests. And the rate of positivity was higher. So CT avoids that problem that, that women, um, the difficulty in having um, positive stresses for women. Another group uh, that we just presented this is diabetics. Uh, not to, there's very little data actually in non-ACS diabetics or in, in, in symptomatic diabetics. We found, not surprisingly, they had more risk factors. They were more likely to have a positive stress to, uh, test, regardless of what type of test it was. They had a worse outcome than non-diabetics. No, no surprises of anything, but characterizing the population. What was a surprise to us, and particularly the magnitude of this difference, is that diabetics did better when they had a CT than when they had a stress. And this was uh, true uh, both for the death MI unstable angina primary endpoint for the trial and even drilling down to the harder cardiovascular endpoint CV death and MI, where we had a 63% reduction in events in diabetics tested with CT than tested with functional testing.
And by comparison, there was no difference in outcomes in the non-diabetics, depending upon test. So let's wind up here and say, what do we know about CT? What's our evidence? More improvement in preventive care. It's no better than stress for the lowest risk patients. Maybe we can defer testing. We have some suggestion that we can select these patients better, but obviously that needs to be examined. CT does improve the use of invasive testing over stress testing. You can make that even better if you add FFR data to that and high-risk plaque data. No large randomized trial has been done looking at the impact on events. So that's another place where there's no data. Calcium score provides better sensitivity and less specificity for coronary disease diagnosis, but provides better prognostic data as well as non-obstructive CAD on CT but similar data in obstructive disease. So that non-obstructive group is both calcium score and CT. For women, there are fewer false positive tests uh, with CT than in stress testing, and CT improves diabetics, uh, outcomes in diabetics who are a higher risk group. So what can we say about what's, what's the best test? Clearly, it's not a simple shift. We can't plug and play CT for stress testing. They provide different information. There are sensitivity and specificity trade-offs. The demographic and comorbid subgroups matter, and our goals of testing matter. And so that uh, hypothesis of precision testing using selective use of different test modalities determined by individual patient risk, clinical goals and the test information provided, all of these tests belong in our armamentarium. We just need to tailor our diagnostic strategies to the individual patient needs. So thank you. Thank you, Pam, very much for such a comprehensive and changing yeah. your field. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, you know, we've, we've dealt with chest pain for so many years, and it's amazing also how things and recommendations are different between across the pond versus here. Yeah. Questions? Miguel. First, thank you, Pam, for visiting us, for being here with us. Okay. Really I've wonderful. On, on yeah. uh, great talk, and I think a wealth of data clearly coming from the PROMIS trial. So those that said at the beginning, yeah, what did you heck did this? I think they should be biting their tongue because there's <laughs> wonderful data there. Now, if you take your data, and you take the 20-year cumulative data that you referred to earlier with calcium score, I think you're making a wonderful case that that patient in the office that has the atypical chest pain that falls in that low to intermediate risk, the most cost-effective way is to do a calcium score first. Cheap, quick, <laughs> in, zero, you're done. Positive, then you can decide as a clinician, do I go with a functional test or whatever? Plus, if it's positive, you already have an enhancement for prevention. What is it is, why has it taken so long for people to just get together and recommend that? I mean, you save money. You do good care of patients. <laughs> Guidelines still are not even mm -hmm. talking about this in that direction. What, what will it take? I don't know. You're preaching to the choir. We, we've got <laughs> over 10 randomized trials that show um, superiority of CT for MI for hard outcomes now. So I, I don't, you know, you only need two <laughs> for a level of evidence A. So we now have 10. And in fact, there's a trial that was done in Holland, a single center trial um, called Crescent, uh, that uh, did exactly the strategy that you said. It was a stable chest pain trial, and it was conditional CT. So it was uh, functional testing versus calcium score. If the calcium score was non-zero, then they did a CT. And so they avoided a CT in, in, in many of their patients, as, as you would expect. Um, and then went on to get that information. And they, they had a very convoluted endpoint, but um, a, a clinical composite endpoint. But suffice it to say that, that uh, in a small cohort, about 350 patients, that was a positive trial supporting the use of uh, calcium score and then conditional CT. So it has actually been tested prospectively. John. Uh, Pam, wonderful review of the literature in terms of where CT sits and where functional testing sits. And I just want to thank you for boosting my CT business. Because I, I, I know that now we'll probably get more and more CTAs than we did before. Um, but I do want to, I want to, again, talk about what Miguel was talking about. Because, you know, CT is cumbersome. It has to be very exacting. You know, 
the, the, uh, the uh, Scott Hart trial was all with 320 slice CT, okay, with very low radiation exposure. Most CT are 64 in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it becomes very problematic when you have motion artifact and you don't know what you're looking at and all this. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of other issues that come into play. Granted, functional testing also has that problem in terms of, you know, artifacts from, from functional testing. But calcium scoring, I again bring this up because we published data a couple years ago in Jack Imaging showing that in patients, where we did calcium scoring and functional testing in mildly symptomatic patients, followed them for a decade, a thousand patients. And what we showed is that in people with normal myocardial perfusion scans, the warranty period was three years. And after that, if you had a calcium score over 400, you went down like this. You had all kinds of events, high, very, very high event rate. If you had a calcium score of zero in a normal scan, you had no events. And I think, a, and I think that's very powerful complementary data in terms of looking at not the people with abnormal myocardial scans, but the ones with questionable studies or the ones with clearly normal studies. The impact of adding calcium scores to those populations in terms of being able to say who needs therapy and who doesn't. Because as you showed out in Promise and also in Scott Hart, most of that therapy was due to preventive therapy in terms of aspirin use and statin use, which, is, which would be markedly underutilized if you just had a normal myocardial perfusion scan and you didn't have anything else. So I want you to just comment on that. So what you're, what you're talking about, what you're proposing, is exactly the precision testing. So you're, using, you're talking about using the functional test to exclude an immediate need for revascularization Correct. and using the calcium score to guide risk prediction, risk stratification, and long-term care. And so it's, it's a beautiful example, thank you, of, of how you use the different tests for different purposes, even in the same patient, because they provide you with different information. And so that's a perfect example of that. Right, and I just want to make one other comment, because now we have a lot of SPECT CT systems, so we can readily get calcium scores at the time we're doing a perfusion scan, for instance. So it's not even like the patient has to come back, necessarily. You can actually see, you can actually get the data all at once. If the scan looks normal, you simply do a calcium score and you're done. Do you? Yeah. Do you, you guys report a calcium score with every yeah. spec? When we do them together, yes. Oh, awesome. That's great. That's a huge advantage. Wonderful talk. I, my question is, most of these tests are predicated on whether we're, we're seeing a lesion that's uh, pre-existing plaque greater than 70% and the significance of that lesion. But as we know, a lot of acute MIs, we miss patients that have, you know, most MIs come from smaller plaques that rupture. Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, you know, since we're missing that percent of, of, of patients that can die from an event that these tests aren't picking up, where is imaging moving? Is there anywhere on the horizon that, that's, that imaging can help with, with predicting those events? Well, I would say that uh, traditional functional testing, stress testing, does miss those 40, 30, 40, 50 percent high-risk plaques that are vulnerable that are going to rupture. By the same token, CT does not miss those. CT detects them and is also able to identify with high-risk plaque analysis and FFR which of those are, are going to have an event in the future. And, and you saw the high-risk plaque data that I presented at an FFR CT data actually tracks with that as well. So I don't have time to show everything. So I think CT does exactly what you're worried about, whereas functional testing doesn't. Last question from yes. an invasive cardiologist. Yeah, so, uh, Pam, uh, I apologize for coming in late. What I heard was great. Uh, let me give you the view from an unrepentant interventionalist. Okay. Uh, let me, before you go, we need you. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so uh, I saw a lot of hazard ratios. Mm -hmm. And hazard ratios, you know, really tell you relative risk. Uh, and they're great if you're an imager and have skin in the game. Uh, if you're uh, an interventionalist, I guess you know your patients have disease, but if you're screening a patient, um, really, you know, the patient wants to know, doc, uh, is something gonna happen to me, yes or no? So uh, tell us a little bit about methodology here. Why use hazard ratios rather than AUCs? Uh, we use both. We use both, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay. So, so um, you know, our low risk and our high risk scores, we, we used AUCs for that, uh, for example. 
Um, it, it's, um, you know, we'd have to ask Carrie Lee when he tells us what, which we're doing. <laughs> well, truthfully, people want to look at, at, at Kaplan Meyer curves. People want to look at time to event curves, and those are the, not really analyzable as an AUC. Yeah. You know, when people come to see us yeah. as outpatients, they, you know, they're asking for dichotomous answers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tanem, that was phenomenal. I think uh, it was very stimulating, and uh, I really think that uh, the field will be growing in, in, in that direction, and there are so many questions to answer, so I think you're going to be busy for some time. Good. <laughs> Good. Great to have you. Thank you.